Oh hey there, I'm Mailman Mile. Welcome to the Spelman Museum of Stamps and Postal History, one of only two philatelic museums in the entire United States. Philatelic, you might ask, what's that? Philately is the study and collection of stamps. The Smithsonian National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C. is the only other philatelic museum in America. The Spelman Museum right here in Western Massachusetts was founded in 1960 by Francis Spelman, a cardinal in the Catholic Church. Today the museum contains over two million philatelic items, ranging from postage stamps to artifacts sent through the mail. The collections that make up the museum are from the Philadelphia National Philatelic Museum, which closed in 1959, from President Eisenhower, musician Yasha Heitfitz, General Matthew Ridgway, and of course, Cardinal Spellman. Francis Spellman was born on May 4, 1889, in Whitman, Massachusetts. Raised as an altar boy at Holy Ghost Church, he loved photography and baseball. He graduated from Fordham in 1911. He was made a cardinal in 1946 and founded this museum seven years before his death in 1967. Cardinal Spellman loved stamps. He famously said, stamps are miniature documents of human history. I love stamp collecting myself. As an American history buff, I love how these little works of art help us remember the events and people that made America the diverse and interesting place that it is. You see them every day, but have you ever really looked at them? Each image is a message, a cultural clue, telling us what we do, where we go, and who we are. Tear down this wall. The story of stamps is the story of America. Indeed, stamps tell the story of America, but did it all begin here? Where were stamps invented and why? <laughs> hey, be nice to that stamp, will you? You see, before there were postage stamps, sending a message wasn't so easy. Over 2,000 years ago, the Roman Circus Publicus had relay stations connecting all parts of the empire but only for official government messages. Even in the Middle Ages, the mails weren't for public use. Individuals had to send their own couriers who carried documents in small chain-link metal bags called chain mail, which is how we got the word mail. By the 1700s, England's postal system was available for both public or private use. While letters were sometimes paid for in advance, most were paid for when delivered, a system which didn't always work. It wasn't until 1840 when Sir Roland Hill invented the penny post in England. That prepaid mail became the rule. Oh, with a gummed stamp as the receipt. Eureka! Eureka! Today, you can send a letter or package anywhere in the country or around the world, all because of that little postage stamp. But stamps aren't just for sending letters. Because of their beautiful designs and craftsmanship, they're treasured by collectors everywhere. In early colonial times, letter writers depended on friends, merchants, and Native Americans to carry messages among the colonies. However, most communication between the colonists and their mother countries ran by ship. In 1639, here in Massachusetts, the first official repository of mail or post office in America was Richard Fairbanks Tavern in Boston. You can still visit today. This was right in line with the European practice of using coffee houses and taverns as mail stations. Local authorities operated post routes within the colonies. 
Then, in 1673, Governor Francis Loveless of New York set up a monthly post between New York and Boston. The service was short-lived, but the Post Riders Trail became known as part of U.S. Route 20. And this famous old Boston Post Road is literally less than two miles from the Spelman Museum. In 1730, Ben Franklin became the Deputy Postmaster General of America. Franklin was only 31 and was already a successful printer, publisher, and civic leader. Franklin made important and lasting improvements in the colonial posts by running the post office out of his printing shop in Philadelphia. He operated post roads from Maine to Florida and between the colonies and the mother country with a regular schedule and posted times. Franklin was dismissed as Joint Postmaster General in 1774 for actions sympathetic to the cause of the colonies. But the Colonial Post continued to run and afforded security to revolutionary messages, which played a vital role in bringing about American independence. Three weeks after the battles of Lexington and Concord, the Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia in May 1775, to plan for the defense of the colonies against British aggression. Because the sending of letters was so important, they again selected Franklin as Postmaster General. He developed a postal system that mainly carried messages between Congress and the armies. America's present postal service descends from the system Franklin put in place. One fun fact, two U.S. presidents became postmasters in their lives, Abraham Lincoln and Harry Truman. Although Truman held the title and signed papers, he immediately turned the position and its pay over to an assistant. Lincoln was the only president who served as a postmaster. In the 1830s in New Salem, Illinois, where Lincoln served, mail was delivered once a week. If an addressee did not collect their mail, Lincoln would deliver it personally, usually carrying it in his hat. Even then, Lincoln was honest to Abe. Though steamboats and trains were the primary sources of mail transport in the 19th century, The year before Lincoln became the 16th President of the United States, the Pony Express began. American transportation pioneer William H. Russell had failed repeatedly to get government backing for an express route to carry mail between Missouri and California. Missouri was the westernmost point reached by the railroad and telegraph. Many thought year-round transportation across this area, a nearly 2,000-mile route, was impossible. It was a vast, unknown land, inhabited primarily by Native Americans. Russell organized his own express to prove otherwise. Riders were recruited hastily, but before being hired, had to swear on a Bible not to cuss, fight, or abuse their animals, and to conduct themselves honestly. On April 3, 1860, the Pony Express began its run through parts of Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and California. On average, a rider covered 75 to 100 miles daily. He changed his horses at relay stations set 10 to 15 miles apart, swiftly transferring himself and his mochila, a saddle cover with four pockets for mail, to the new mount. The fastest delivery was in March 1861 when President Abraham Lincoln's inaugural address was carried from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California in seven days and 17 hours. By summer 1861, the Pony Express began operating as a mail route. By that time, the Central Overland California and Pikes Peak Express Company were deeply in debt. Though they had charged as much as $5 a half ounce for a letter, At a time when ordinary U.S. postage was no more than 10 cents, the company did not make its operating expenses. The Pony Express officially ended in October 1861, after the transcontinental telegraph line was completed. But it became an enduring legend in America's postal history. By the middle of the Civil War, the door delivery envisioned by President Lincoln became possible on a larger scale. Before 1863, citizens sent and picked up their mail at the post office, but by 1864, free city delivery had been established in 65 cities nationwide. In 1890, nearly 41 million people, 65% of the American population, 
lived in rural areas where they still had to pick up their mail at the post office, leading one farmer to ask, why should the cities have fancy mail service and the old colonial system still prevail in the country districts? Many argued that rural delivery might encourage young people to stay on the farm if correspondence and magazines eased their isolation. After years of controversy, rural free delivery finally became the standard. Another enduring legend in postal history is Oni, mascot of the Railway Mail Service. On an autumn day in 1888, a shaggy pup crept into the Albany, New York post office. The postal employee named Owen allowed him to stay and the station named him Oni. Oni soon began riding mail wagons. As Oni traveled farther, the railway clerks attached metal baggage tags to his collar to identify him. He was soon so weighed down by his collection of tags, he was given a little jacket to distribute their weight more evenly. While being shown off to an Ohio newspaper reporter, Oni bit the postal clerk who was handling him. The postmaster had Oni put down. He is now part of the Smithsonian National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C. The 20th century brought additional changes to the Postal Service. By the end of World War I, the United States enjoyed scheduled airmail delivery service. In 1933, FDR's New Deal murals began to color the walls of post offices across the nation. With World War II, the nation saw experienced postal employees leaving jobs to fight in the war, which created the need for a simplified zip code system. In 1992, the U.S. Postal Service made an unprecedented move, allowing the public to select the artwork for the Elvis Presley commemorative stamp. Young Elvis or Old Elvis? America returned nearly 1.2 million ballots, and Young Elvis won. Selling 124 million stamps, it became the most popular U.S. commemorative stamp of all time. Our postal service and stamps continue to change, but the stories preserved on our stamps have become a valuable part of our shared American history, and hopefully will continue to do so for many more generations. Well, when you visit our museum, we certainly want to make sure you see certain special stamps, such as the very first stamp called the One Penny Black, which is from England, and also the very two first American stamps that featured Ben Franklin and George Washington. We rotate our exhibits, so we can't really say what specific exhibit you might see when you come, but we do like to give you a tour of the gallery and uh, point out uh, the highlights that uh, will educate you about stamps and maybe bring back memories if you remember collecting stamps as a child. Next time you get a letter, notice the stamp and think of U.S. postal history and how it's preserved a legacy of our shared ideas and culture.